being good and being God. We thank you, Father God, for another chance, another privilege, another opportunity to come before you. Now we bring our burdens, Father God. We bring all our messed up ways. We bring all that we need forgiveness on behalf of. We bring it before you, Father God. Lord, we thank you, Father God, for being the great physician, the healer, the one who keeps us. We thank you, Lord, for ministering to us even on tonight. We ask you to forgive us for our sins and bless us to hear from you on tonight. It's in Jesus' name we pray that you bless your word. Amen and thank God. Leave chapter 10 on tonight, Acts chapter 10. <clears throat> Told you two weeks ago that we will be back in Acts chapter 10. We are verses 9 through 16 tonight. Acts chapter 10 verses 9 through 16 is where we are tonight. 
Thank you so much for accompanying us over to the Christ Way Church on last week. Thank you for being there, being a part of the Christ Way experience where the revival was going on last week. Thank you so much for, for attending. Amen. Amen. Acts chapter 10, verses 9 through 16 is where we will hang our hats on tonight. Amen. You got your hat hanging there? Amen. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Thank all of you all for showing up to Bible study tonight. Every last one of you, we appreciate your being here and being a part of Bible study on tonight. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm glad you're glad to be here. Acts chapter 10, verses 9 through 16 is where we are. We're in the book of Acts. We already know that some things have taken place, and Peter is one of the key speakers, the key persons, the key players in the book of Acts, especially chapters 9 and 10. So in chapter 10, we're dealing with the fact that Cornelius has sent a delegation Cornelius, a devout man, has sent a delegation over to find Peter and talk to Peter and ask Peter to come and do some things for him. Amen? So he sends this delegation over there. Now there are three people he sends. Who are those three people he sends? Cornelius, a devout man. The Bible says that Cornelius was a devout man and not only was Cornelius a devout man, his servants, his soldiers, and his slaves were devout men also because they followed the pattern of Cornelius, right? So Cornelius sends them to Simon's house to find Simon, the, Simon Peter, right? Sends them to Joppa. Everybody there? So as he sends them to Joppa, who are these three people he sends? Who are these three people he sends? Two of his household servants. Two of his household servants. And a devout soldier. And a devout soldier. Where is that found in your Bible? Verse 7. Verse number 7 of Acts chapter 10, right? Verse number 7 of Acts chapter 10. He sends a devout Soldier, he sends two servants, sends a delegation of three people, right? And as he sends this delegation of three people, he is going, he's sending them to go find Peter. He's sending them to go find Peter. Now, these men are devout men, meaning what? What does it mean when they are devout men? Righteous. They're righteous men. They're godly men. They love the Lord. Amen. Any folk in the house love the Lord? Anybody? Anybody love the Lord? Now, now that I know that you love the Lord, do you act like you love him? Yes. yes. I present myself as well. Do you obey him? Yes. Do you put aside your ways for his ways? So let's look at verses 9 through 16 tonight. He sends this delegation. Now, if I was to give this a title, if I was to give this a title, I would call this more than food or bigger than food. Bigger than food or more than food. And as we go through this particular pericope, you'll see why I would call it bigger than food. Because it looks like food is the subject matter. But really, there's a bigger thing going on in Acts chapter 10. In Acts chapter 10, verse number 9, you find these words. The, the next day, as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to do what? Pray. To pray. Peter goes up on the housetop to pray. When you read that, <laughs> or when I read that, did you think, <laughs> did you think, why did he go up on the housetop? Get away from everything. This was a place where he can be alone with the Lord. So he goes up on the housetop. 
People don't go go through trouble to get up there to pray, right? So Peter knew that if he went on the housetop, he would have some privacy. How often do you spend time in privacy with the Lord? How often do you get away from the crowd? Peter goes on the housetop to pray. He goes up there for what reason? To pray. Peter goes on the housetop to pray. So sometimes prayer takes some extra effort. Mm, look at that. Sometimes it takes extra effort to get along with the Lord. We have so many things dancing and popping and moving and noise around us. Sometimes we need to get away to get along with the Lord. So Peter goes on top of the housetop to pray. The Bible says Peter went up on the housetop to pray. And he went a certain time. He went around what hour? The sixth hour. What is the sixth hour? What is the sixth hour? She's in her own little world over there. We're going to leave her alone. We're going to leave her in her own little world. I'm asking what's the sixth hour. She said she thought it would be the ninth hour. The sixth hour. If it starts at 6 a.m., what is the sixth hour? Six. 12 noon, right? Say yes. yes. There, there, there are six hours from 6 a.m. to 12 noon. That is six. Yes. yes. If it's six hours from, from 6 a.m., then it has to be 12. And 12 is noon. Yes? Yes. So he goes up on the top of the rooftop. He goes up on the top of the housetop. He goes up there for a reason. That reason is to pray. Let me tell you, you need to get along with the Lord every day. Traditionally, the Jewish people would pray in the morning and they would pray in the evening. But here is Peter going up to pray at noonday. So it's a message here. Yes, we ought to pray when others are praying, but we ought to spend some time praying when it's not prayer time for everybody else. That's right. We ought to spend some time in prayer along with the Lord as well as we ought to spend time in prayer when there is a community of prayer going on. Peter steals away. He goes up on the top of the mount of the housetop. Jesus went into the wilderness. Jesus went into Gethsemane. Jesus went into the mountains to pray. Where's your prayer ground? Do you have a special place place that you go to pray? Or you come to the conclusion as some saints, I can pray anywhere God can hear me. Why do we close our eyes when we pray? Because we saw grandmama and big mama and all them close their eyes and big daddy. Is that why we close our eyes when we pray? Why? Do we close our eyes when we, why do we bow our head when we pray? You ever thought about that? In respect of, of God. Say again. In respect of God. In respect to God. Anybody else? To we, blot out everything else. To, to blot out everything else. Okay, anybody else? So Peter gets in a place by himself. You know why people put air conditions up on a pedestal? Because criminals don't want to go through a hard time to get to. Peter goes on top of the housetop to pray. He knows he will be secluded up there. He knows he will be segregated up there. He knows he will be separated up there because people don't want to go through a lot of, a lot of stuff. 
Why don't we get on our knees to pray? Okay. Why do some people pray laying in the bed? Don't tell me because they can't get up. So they get comfortable to pray. I see. They get comfortable to pray. My, my, that's the truth that I ever heard. The next day, verse number 9, Acts chapter 10, verse 9. The next day, as they went on their journey. Who are they? That delegation goes on their journey. They drew near to the city. They drew near to the city where Peter was. Peter went up on the housetop to pray, to communicate with God. Peter went up on the housetop to talk to God and listen to God talking to him. Prayer is a dialogue. Prayer is not a monologue. Prayer is when God talks to us and we talk to God. We ought to not just talk to God. We ought to let God talk to us. Has God ever said anything to you? Have you ever given God time to talk to you? Are you just, Lord, lay me down to sleep? I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Or are we going to talk to God and allow God to talk to us? The problem with that prayer that, that many children pray, number one, we have to teach our children that if your soul is going to be anchored in the Lord, if the Lord is going to take your soul, if you're going to be with the Lord, you got to make that decision before you die. Lord, lay me down to sleep. God has the power to lay you down to sleep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. While you praying that the Lord takes your soul, you need to be getting in touch with God and giving your soul back to God. Yes? yes. So we need to make sure that we teach children the proper way. And the, the proper way is, Lord, I'm praying now. I'm asking you to save me now. I believe in the death, burial, and resurrection now. Because we may not get a chance to invite Christ into our lives. How many of you in the room knows when you're going to die? No one? Mm -hmm. I thought y'all were smart. That's God's There's no smart folk in the room? Yeah, we smart, but that means we know when we're going to do it. I don't know about God. Pastor Gary Shook of Fellowship of the Woodless Church wrote a book called 30 Days to Live. We did a whole Bible study here at the New Beginning Church on this book. 30 days to live. And my key question that I ask you, if you knew you were going to die in 30 days, what would you change? Just the days of days. If you knew you were going to die in 30 days, would you change anything about you? If you knew you were going to die in 30 days, would you just keep doing what you're doing? No. So it's Davis, Davis. Uh, I, I think I would do what I'm doing. You keep doing what you're doing? You're going to have to treat your pastor better though, baby. I try. Him got to do better. I mean, because I, you don't want to regret. I, I guess. You don't want to regress or regret. Regress. Regret. 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 Right. I don't. I. You don't want to regret. I don't want to regret doing not doing, doing something or not doing something. Exactly, right. Exactly. Because okay. somebody who has faced cancer. Mm -hmm. After that. You want to live gonna, your life, right? You want to live your life, and you're gonna do everything you feel like you need to do. You're gonna treat right. people like you feel like. And then you're gonna you're gonna learn that there's people who are still not gonna reciprocate that. Okay, so but, so basically you want to make sure you get on the road to treating people right. Yeah. Okay, anybody else? So it's the woods woods. <laughs> Would you change anything if you had thirty days to live, and you knew you were gonna get out of here in thirty days? I don't. I don't. I don't. I 
don't think I will, I would change anything, but I would start treating people different. You would do better about your pastor. I understand. <laughs> Y'all heard that, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I hope dumping in the bar. So you would treat people differently. Tell me about that. You if would treat... I had a dislike for someone, you know, I would try to make amends with them. Okay. If you you had alt with your brother, you would try to make amends of dislike with somebody. You, well, Sister, Sister Woods, I just want to let you know you don't know if you got 30 days. Well, I don't know, but I'm, I, if I did know, I had 30 days. So you're going to wait till you know? You're going to wait till the doctor tell you to make men's with me? I mean, with people? The doctor don't know. Okay. Who else want to tell? Who else want to tackle this? Sister Bernie, if you knew you had 30 days to live, how would you handle it? I don't know. Deacon Alfred, would you change anything? He doesn't know. Who's next? Sister Sister Darrington, if you knew you had 30 days to live, would you change anything? What would you do differently? My change is try to bring others closer to God. You would reach other people. Okay. Brother Miles, Sister Henry, what would you change? I wait to hear your answer. <laughs> Sister Davis, what would you change? Brother Whitlock, what would you change? I, Sister Davis. I think I'd go on some more trips and spend some more money. <laughs> so if she had 30 days to live, she'll leave me broke is what she said. <laughs> <laughs> That sounds like what she said. She said she'd go on some more trip and spend some more money. I mean, you heard it. She said she said she'd spend every dime. You can make it if you want to. If you can't make it, that's your business. You should have been saving your own money. Now, I got all that out of there. No, you should be saving extra money because she's going to spend all hers. Brother Whitlock said he'll quit work. <laughs> 30 days to live. He said he got enough to, he got a nest egg to live off for 30 days. Uh, he said she'll spend more time with family and less time worried about what I cannot change. Eileen Taylor says she will spend more time with family and don't worry about what she can't change. So, if you have 30 days to live, and of course none of us know what those 30 days are. Therefore, we must act like we got 30 days or 30 seconds or 30 minutes today. The Bible says Cornelius was a righteous man. He didn't know how long he was going to live, so he lived for the Lord. Would you pray more if you had 30 days to live? The Bible said Peter went on top of the house top to pray, and he went up there around the sixth hour. So, in Acts chapter 10, verses 9 through 13, through 16, we're talking about Peter and how Peter is reacting. There are, some things, there are some things going on that we're going to talk about, but the fact is Peter thought enough of his relationship with God that he would spend time with God. So, as Henry says, she would live life God wanted her to live. Live the life God wanted her to live. <laughs> so to him, you only got 30 minutes or so, and you want to live the way God wants you to live. I think if all of us knew we only had 30 minutes or 30 days, we would change a lot of things. Unless we perfect, right? So Peter changed his praying style. Change his praying time because the Jews prayed morning and evening, and here we find Peter praying at noonday. One thing we have to get to do, as Peter has done, we have to get away from traditional stuff. It was the tradition, it was the custom of the Jews to pray in the morning and pray in the evening. And we find Peter praying, all tradition, all traditions are not good traditions. Name some traditions that we need to get away with that we still do. Well, 
or some tradition you grew up in that you knew wasn't right or you found out later that wasn't right. Covering the Lord's Supper. Covering the Lord's Supper. What's wrong with that? Is it a bad thing to cover the Lord's Supper? No. No. Why do they why do people cover the Lord's Supper? Why they did cover it? Yes. So they actually covered it because flies, and they were meeting outside, or they had windows that went up and the flies came in, right? But we continued that tradition because it was just that, a tradition. What's another tradition that we sometimes hold to? That we see people do, and they do it all the time. Tradition. It's, and we found out through studying the word, it's just a tradition. Deacons were the only one who prayed. In the early, before, before the pastor Deacons only one did devotions. Who does the, who do devotions here at our church? Everybody, Everybody that I can beg to do it. <laughs> yes. yes. Anybody that I can pull, drag, or a browbeat to, to oh, pray. Yes. <laughs> so everybody ought to be in prayer privately and publicly. The excuse of those who don't want to pray publicly is that I have my own secret closet and the Bible says I can go to my secret closet. Yes, you're right. But we ought not refrain from praying publicly. He goes up to the rooftop so he can be alone. He goes up to the housetop to pray around the sixth hour. Verse number 10. Then he became very hungry. Now he went up there to pray, not to eat. But he got hungry while he was praying. So that tells me he may have prayed for a while. Now you sure don't want to ask folk to pray for a long time. Either in private or in public. The Bible says while he was praying, then he became very hungry and he wanted to eat. He became very hungry and he wanted some to eat. He wanted something to eat. We have to understand that even though prayer is a spiritual thing, sometimes it can be physically taxing. In the revival last week, Pastor Fletcher painted such a beautiful picture of how Jesus prayed. He talked about Jesus praying in the garden until sweat began to run like drops of blood. And he explained to us that sometimes when you're agonizing, blood begins to flow and ball in your arms and your body and your face. So much so until it pulsates out of your vein. Have you ever prayed like that before? Well, you were agonizing so greatly until blood and sweat began to even flow from your veins and your skin. You did an awesome job of explaining how, what the meaning of, of agonizing and prayer. The Bible says that Peter prayed till he got hungry. <laughs> he prayed till he wanted something to eat or some to eat. He prayed till he wanted something to eat, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance. While they were making what ready? While they were making the food ready. While the host was preparing the food, Peter went up on the housetop to pray. He prayed up there until he got hungry. And when he got hungry, he wanted something to eat. The host was still preparing the food, so he couldn't eat. The text says, he fell into a trance. What's a trance? A vision. What's a trance? He had a had a what? A dream. 
He had a dream. He is alert, but he's thinking. When we dream, we think we have to be sleep. When we dream, we think we have to be comatose. But Peter fell into a trance. Verse number 11. And he saw heaven open. When we pray, regardless of how hungry we are, we ought to want heaven to open up. Man, this is a good text here. That he prayed, he got hungry, he wanted something to eat, and while he was praying, he fell into a trance, and when he went into a trance, he saw heaven. And he saw heaven open. Lord, I'm praying, Lord, I'm asking you to open heaven. Because I know if he opens heaven, he is able to pour down a blessing big enough that I can't receive. He's able to bless me with blessings where I won't have room enough to receive. The Bible says, as they made ready, he fell into a trance. Verse number 11, 11. He saw heaven opened. He saw heaven opened. First of all, he saw heaven open up. And then he saw heaven opened. Meaning that he was able to look in heaven. Meaning that heaven is giving him attention. Meaning that heaven is on alert waiting to bless us as he's waiting to bless him. Saw heaven open. So the Bible says he saw heaven opened. So heaven opened up saying, hey, the blessings are here. If you're going to get blessed, you're going to have to get them from heaven. And not only did it open, it also means that heaven is receiving my prayers I just need to pray. Not only that, if I'm going to be blessed, it's going to take a blessing from heaven to bless me. Now people wonder why people who are not right and not living right seem like they got it going on. It's called diligence. If you're diligent on your job, you get a paycheck. If you're not diligent on your job, whether you saved or not, you're not going to get a paycheck. Or if you get a paycheck, you won't be getting it too long. Yes? It's called diligent. The dope dealer is diligent at what he does. That's why he can ride in whatever he wants to ride in for a while. Prostitutes can buy and live like they want to for a while. But the Bible says in Psalm 73 that the, the psalmist was looking at the unrighteous and he was envious of them. The psalmist says, I saw the unrighteous and they were digging the scene with the gangster lean, gangster white wall, ooh, 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 ooh. TV antenna in the back. Leaning. Three inch white walls. I'm leaning like a gangster. I got it going on, but I'm not living right. Let me tell you, you can buy all the stuff you want to, and you can buy all the stuff you can afford if you're just diligent. So having stuff doesn't mean you blessed. It means that you did whatever it takes to get it, period, whether it was right or wrong. But how long it lasts, it depends on your relationship with God. If you got the right relationship with God, God is able to keep it. God is able to bless you. God is able to keep you even holy. I didn't say keep you saved. You're going to be saved. If you're saved, you're going to be saved. You're going to continue to be saved. But holiness is to be sanctified, to be set apart, to be different from other people. God and God alone can keep you. 
when you say the Holy Spirit seals you to the day of redemption. He keeps you. Even if you wear pants to church, the Holy Spirit keeps you. Even if you smoke and drink a little bit, the Holy Spirit, if you say the Holy Spirit keeps you. Even every now and then if you cuss somebody out. I'm not giving you the right to cuss anybody, to drink, to smoke. I'm just telling you, if you are saved, you will continue to be saved. I heard a preacher say one day, my wife and I went to Vegas and we came back still saved. The suggestion here is that we had an opportunity to no longer be saved. But John chapter 10, verses 22 through 30 says that you will always be saved once you're saved. Jesus says in John chapter 10, verses 22 through 30, Jesus says that those who I know I have in the palm of my hand. He says, you don't know me, and that's why you do the things of the devil. He says, but those who know me, those who are mine, they belong to the Father, they belong to me. I have them, Jesus says, in the palm of my hand. And no one and no thing, not even the devil in hell, can take them out of the palm of my hand. Because I'm saved now, I'm going to be saved throughout eternity. And eternity never ends. I wonder how people get this situation confused because they think that you can lose your salvation when you didn't do any deed to get your salvation. You receive your salvation based on your faith and what Jesus did, not what you did or didn't do. See, people think when you stop wearing makeup, you say. And if you start wearing makeup, you aren't saved. People think that if you wear big lip, big looping earrings, that, that says you're unsaved. People think that if you put a tattoo on your body, then you're unsaved. When it only took Jesus and what Jesus has done in the finishing work on Calvary and his resurrection to save you. So you didn't do anything but believe. And even the faith that you have God gave it to you according to Romans chapter 10. God says that, that he gave to every man a measure of faith. He gave to every man a measure of faith. And that measure of faith was to believe in him. I'm telling you, even the faith that you have, God donated it to you. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 says, by grace we are saved. Through faith, that is not of ourselves. Nobody can boast about it. You didn't do anything to get saved, so what makes you think you can do something to be unsaved? The Bible says, wow, well, I'm, I'm back at Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, verse number 11. And he saw heaven open up in a object like a great sheet bound at all four corners, a, a vessel, a object, like a great sheet appeared before Peter while Peter is in this trance. He's up there to pray. While he's praying, he gets hungry. While he's praying, he wants something to eat. While he's praying, he goes into a trance. A great sheet drops down. Where did this sheet come from? It came from heaven. And it came to the earth. Look at verse number 11. And, and saw heaven open in an object like a great sheet bound at four corners, descending to him and let down to the earth. Heaven, God, let a sheet down before Peter. It was bound by four corners. Let me just tell you, God leaves no one out. All four corners. I know we, we live on a globe. I understand that scientists say that the earth is round. Even if it's round, God deals with all four corners when he deals with us. 
He says, a great sheet bound on all four corners, descending to him and let down to the earth. Verse number 12. This is what was on the sheet. Are you ready? He says, now Peter is hungry. Peter is hungry. Peter needs something to eat. And then Peter began to act like some spoiled child. He says, let down all four corners. Verse number 12. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals. All kinds. Of, what, what do you like to eat? Chicken. There were chicken on there. What do you like to eat? Four, four-footed beasts. Four-foot and footed animals on the earth. All kinds that were on the earth. There were wild beasts there. There were creeping things there. What do you don't like? They're creeps. Puppy tails and puppy dog tails. <laughs> Stuff that creeps. Spiders. Bugs. All this kind of stuff. The creeping things. And then birds of the air was on there. I told you to begin with, this pericope is about more than food. This pericope is bigger than food. But check it out. God sets us up. Peter is hungry. Peter needs something to eat. A great sheep falls down from heaven, comes before Peter all the way down to the earth. And guess what? There's food on the sheep. But it's a setup. There's food. There's food right there on the sheep. All kinds of four-footed beasts and animals of the earth. There are wild beasts of the earth. There are creeping things from the earth. There are birds of the air on that sheep. And all of a sudden, verse number 13 says, And a voice came to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. King James says, Rise, Peter, slay and eat. When you get together for Thanksgiving dinner, you got all the family members there, and after your prayer, somebody says, Rise, Peter, slay and eat. Now, there's nobody in the family named Peter. But we just finished prayer, and they thought that Uncle Bubba, with his drunk self, made this up. It came from the Bible. Rise, Peter, slay and eat. Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Come on, come on, Peter, let's eat. Guess why? Guess why the voice says, rise, Peter, and eat? Because all the food is on the, on the sheet, right? Everything you can think of. Some people don't like seafood. Some people can't even afford to eat seafood because it'll kill them. Some people, some people don't like birds. Some people don't like chicken. Some people don't like beef. But everything's on the sheet. Peter got a selection. Matter of fact, Peter has a Piccadilly's right before him. <laughs> Peter has a buffet set before him. And then this voice from heaven says, Rise, Peter. Kill and eat. Check this out. Something has to die in order for us to live. Ooh, boy, that's a good close there. Something has to die. Even somebody had to die. Something has to die in order for us to live. So he says, rise, Peter, slay and eat. Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Look at Acts chapter 10, verse number 14. But Peter said, not so, Lord. First of all, Peter knows he's talking to the Lord. He knows that this sheep came from heaven. But Peter is stuck in tradition. Peter is stuck in the custom. And the custom is that we don't eat unclean, undecent things because we're Jewish. Let's look for verse 14. And Peter answered and said, not so, Lord. Now, is Peter being disrespectful to the Lord? Is Peter telling the Lord... What he's not going to do? Yes, he is. And guess what? Every time I told the Lord what I wasn't going to do, I'm doing it right now. 
So Peter says, not so, Lord. He says emphatically, Lord, I ain't doing that. He sounds like when I tell some of these doctors, no, I ain't doing that. No, I'm not doing that. I walked into the doctor's office and the doctor had her daughter come to me. She'd been practicing doctoring for practicing medicine for for 12 years now. So the doctor's trying to retire. She's going to give it over to her daughter. I walk in there. She's doing an exam because I try to go once a year like I ought to. Any other time, I just want to call in and say, hey, this is what's going on. Send me some medication, right? So I walk into the doctor's office. It's my annual physical. This doctor is not there, but her daughter is there. She walks in, put the telescope on me, breathe. <sighs> You sound clear. Then she pushed on my stomach a couple of times. She said, oh, you got a hernia. I'm sending you to a surgeon. I said, you ain't sending me nowhere. <laughs> I know that's right. <laughs> I said, you, you're not, you, and I, I wasn't proper. I didn't talk to, the, I, I don't know if it was slang, but my words were, you ain't sending me nowhere. The proper way is to say, no, ma'am, I'm not going to be going anywhere. And after I saw her, I went to the front desk and I said, never, ever, ever uh, schedule me an appointment unless the doctor is in the house. <laughs> uh, but her daughter is taking over the practice. Well, I'm leaving the practice. There's been more than 12, 15 years ago, and I hadn't had a hernia surgery yet. She pushed on my stomach two times and said, oh, you got hernia, I'm sending you to a surgeon. You're not, you ain't sending me nowhere. So that's what Peter, Peter is saying to the Lord. Now I said it to the doctor. Peter is saying to the Lord, no, Lord. And he goes on to say, for I have never eaten any common or unclean thing. I've never eaten any. Remember, the Jews are very particular. If you look at Leviticus, if you look at Leviticus chapter 11, you will see that the Jews didn't eat anything. There were special foods that the Jews would eat. Peter is still living in tradition. And as he's living in tradition, tradition has overtaken him. So much so until he's telling the Lord what he's not going to do. Are you so stuck in tradition that you tell the Lord what you're not going to do? This is bigger than food. So Peter says, no, Lord, I ain't doing that. For I've never eaten any common or unclean thing. But look what God says. And a voice spoke to him again the second time. What God has cleansed. You must not call common or you must not call unpurified or you must not call unclean. It says, when God has cleansed, you must not call common. The word common, impure. When God has purified, you can't call it impure. What God has has created, you can't call it common, you can't call it unclean, because it's been touched by God. This is where I say to you, it's bigger than food. Because remember that at this time, the Jews and the Gentiles had no dealing with each other. This is more of a pericope that deals with racism and prejudice than it is with food. God is teaching Peter a lesson as he's teaching us in the 21st century that every life matters. That all lives matter. Now let me tell you this. Black lives matter because black lives are the one that's being condemned and terminated. So everybody else attached to Black Lives Matter and say, oh, blue lives matter, white lives matter, all lives matter. But let me tell you, if a house is on fire in the neighborhood, if a, a house is burning in the neighborhood, 
several people going to call 911. And they're going to put their lights on, their sirens on, and cars going to move over. People who are walking are going to walk to that house. And all the attention is going to be on the burning house. The ambulance is going to show up and the fire truck is going to show up. And they're going to go to that house, 602, 603, 601. They're going to miss all the rest of the houses. They're not going to even pay attention to the other houses. They're looking for that burning house. Their attention is focused on that burning house. And because their attention is on that burning house, they're going to go to that house and give that house all their attention. So when we say Black Lives Matter, what we're saying is the house is on fire in the black neighborhood. There's a, there is a fire on the black man, the black woman, the white, the, the black child in his own fire. We need some attention. That's all we say. We're not discounting that other lives matter. It's just the fact that we're the one burning right now. When we look at the text, the voice tells Peter, Peter, whatever God has cleansed, whatever God has taken care of, what God has purified, don't ignore it and don't call it common. Don't call it unclean. So Peter is an uppity Jew. And he looked down on Gentile. Matter of fact, the Apostle Paul had to had to get on Peter one time because Peter was hanging out with the Jews. They were playing domino, playing spade, and they were running, hanging out together. And then when when the up uh, he was hanging out with the Gentiles, and when the other Jews showed up, he runs away from them and sit off and act like he was never with the Gentiles. And he began to hang out with the Jews all, all over again. He was just playing dominoes, talking about, I got five, I got 15. <laughs> but then when the Jews show up, Peter bags off of them and go get with the Jews again. The Bible said the Apostle Paul stood him to his face. So stop being a racist. Stop being fake. Stop being phony. So Jesse Jackson was right. Red, yellow, black, and white, they're all are precious in Jesus' sight. So if you're still prejudiced, if you're still discriminating, if you're still a racist in the 21st century, you might as well get over it. I told the white man, I said, man, you're so concerned that your white daughter is going to marry a black man. Let me just tell you, in a few more years, all of us are going to look like him. And I pointed to a Hispanic with dark skin. All our children, all our grandchildren are going to look like lighter than we are. And all of his children are going to be darker than he is. And you're going to have a heart attack if you think it's going to stay like that. Matter of fact, your child ain't pure white right now. So the Bible, the Bible deals with this in, in, in Acts chapter 10. God is dealing with Peter about racism. He deals with Peter about being prejudiced. He's telling Peter, don't you dare call things uncommon. Don't you dare call things unclean. Don't you dare compare the common to the uncommon. Don't you call yourself pure and say the Gentiles are not pure. What God has blessed, what God has cleansed, will always be cleansed. Amen. Amen. Verse number 16, I'll leave you alone. This was done three times. Now Peter told God three times. God I ain't doing that. Who you think won? Peter says to God three times. The Bible said this was done three times and the object was taken up into heaven again. Sometimes God said, look, I'm done with it. Now you do what you want to do with it. Peter has a way of, of having to deal with three times. When was the other time Peter had to deal with three times? Hmm? He denied Jesus. Peter said, God, Jesus, I'm going to die for you. I'm going to always be there with you. Sounds like some people that used to be members of the New Beginning Church. 
Pastor, you ain't got to worry about me. I'm going to always be there. I'm going to support you in all your visions. Peter says, God, Jesus, I'm going to always be with you. Jesus looks at Peter and says, Peter, before the cock crows, you're going to deny me thrice, three times. So not only did Jesus have to deal with Peter, the voice from heaven had to deal with Peter three times. And the Bible says he dealt with them three times and God took the sheep back from earth, back up into heaven. And Peter became a mighty evangelist and preached and 3,000 souls were saved. The thing that it says is there's still hope for you, brothers. <laughs> there's still hope. There is still hope for us who are holding on to the past. There is still hope. The Bible says Peter went up to have prayer. While he was up there for prayer, he got hungry. Then he needed something to eat. He wanted something to eat. And after he wanted something to eat, he fell into a trance. It didn't say if he became weak, but the Bible says he fell into a trance and a great sheep was bound by four corners, descended from heaven to earth, right before him on earth, all kinds of beasts, all kinds of creeping things, all kinds of birds were on this sheet. What God is saying to us is that we got to acknowledge all kinds of people. We got to stop being spiritually stuck up. We got to acknowledge all kinds of people. And the voice came said, rise, Peter, slay and eat. The Bible says it's happened three times. It happened three times, and then God took the sheep back on up to heaven. The key is here, we got to acknowledge all people. We got to respect all people. We have to love all people. We have to spend time with all people. We have to make sure that we respect all people to the point where God knows our heart because that with which God has cleaned up, he is God has cleaned them up. There are several churches in the city of Houston where a white congregation and a black congregation get together about every quarter and they worship together and they spend time together. And then there are other congregations where the white preacher goes over to the black preacher's Congregation and preach to them, and, and the black preacher goes to the white church and preaches to them. It's an effort to unite all people. Red, yellow, black, and white. We're all are precious in God's sight. And the only way to unite all people, God did it 2,000 years ago on a skull hill called Calvary. We cannot love folk on our own. Jesus died on Calvary. He was buried in a bar tomb. He rose from the dead so we can have the power of loving all people. Amen. The door of the church is open. Amen. The invitation is extended. This is an opportunity for somebody to see God bigger than food. To see this message greater than something to eat. Jesus says, God says, the Holy Spirit says, God purifies and therefore is not unclean. Amen. If you've never been saved, you can't love all people. If you never received Christ as your Savior, you can't mingle with every race. You can fake it. But tonight, I give you an opportunity to get to know Jesus. The one who died for your sins and was buried in a borrowed tomb. Jesus the Christ, the Lamb of God. Would you bow your head with me and invite Jesus into your life for the very first time and invite him in to be your Savior? Just say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins.
I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God. We believe if you confess Jesus as your Savior, you are now saved, believing that he died for our sins and was buried in a barber tomb and rose from the dead. And if you are without a church home, I want to say to you that every person needs a church home. I recommend the New Beginning Church where Jesus is the captain of the ship, where Jesus is the main attraction. Feel free to come and join us as you have tonight, every Wednesday night at 7.15 p.m. in person or online. Of course, we prefer it in person. 7.15 every Wednesday. And for Sunday school, every Sunday at 9 a.m. And our worship service every Sunday at 10.30 a.m. This Sunday, we're celebrating Latino Heritage Month from September 15th to October 15th is Latino Heritage Month. So this, this Sunday, we'll be celebrating Latino Heritage Month. Please come and be a part of this great celebration where we live out Acts chapter 10, where no one is left behind and everybody is special in God's sight. See you at 10.30 this Sunday, 10.30 p.m. We're located at 4251 Sherman Road, Houston, Texas, 77048. USA, that is 4251 Shurmai. Shurmai is spelled S-C-H-U-R-M-I-E-R. S-C-H-U-R-M-I-E-R. Shurmai Road, Houston, Texas, 77048 USA. It is offering time. It is time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. If you want to give electronically, you can do so by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Or you can mail in your gifts to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That's P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Father God, we thank you for these gifts. We thank you for every give up. We ask you to bless us. As we come to give, we ask you to bless our gifts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And thank God. Are there any praise report or prayer requests? Praise reports or prayer requests. We are we are still praying for the Whitlocks, the Whitlocks, Karen and Katrina Whitlock. We're praying for, for them that God will continue to give them favor. So we're lifting them before the Lord. Amen. We are lifting them before the Lord. We want, we do have a praise report. Their sister Trish Horace, Patricia Horace, is now doing good. She is she is being blessed of the Lord. And so we um, we are praying and continue to lift her up and we praise God for that praise report. We're praying for Sister Blanca Galvan. We're praying for her that God will continue to bless her, that she will mend very well as she goes through the results of our fall here on our campus. Amen. Let's praise the Lord. Yes, sir. What's her name? Araya. Praise report. Amen. She's doing well. Why don't we thank God for that? Amen. Thank God for the little Araya. Amen. Well, we stand to be dismissed. Please join us on Sunday morning for a bilingual service as we celebrate Latino heritage. Father God, we thank you now, Lord. We bless your name. We thank you, Lord, that you made everybody precious in your sight. We thank you for blessing us and keeping us. We thank you, Father God, for another chance to get it right with you. We ask you to bless our church that we will continue to be a sharp, shining light 
for men, women, boys, and girls to see that we will continue to lift up Jesus and he will continue to draw all men unto himself. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise and only true God, unto him be power, glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us sing together. Amen. God bless you. We are a united in church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. You are dismissed.